We have Dr. Cassie Jones. How are you, Cassie? Great. I'm so excited to be with you, Marcio. Appreciate you being here. And for those that do not know you, uh, if you can just share with us your journey. Sure. Well, I grew up in North Dakota raising sheep, and um, I was always interested in pigs because I grew up raising and, sh uh, and showing market hogs, and that brought me to K-State as an undergraduate student. And so I found the land of purple and fell in love, and so I got my bachelor's and my master's degrees here at K-State, got my PhD in swine nutrition under John Patience. Um, at Iowa State University, and then was fortunate to be able to come back on faculty at K-State, and I have been here for the last eight years. Super cool. The land of purple, right? Even the trash cans and the trash truck are purple. Yes, and the porta potties. <laughs> Everything is purple. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's, yeah, it's a great, great place. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you have expertise in, in, in feed safety and also you teach a lot of undergrads. Um, maybe you can dive uh, first on the feed safety side of things. And so what, what's the latest there? You know, you, you can touch on the evolution, but also what is the latest right now? Yeah, um, as we think about the evolution, I guess it's funny because every time I say I've been at K-State for eight years, that's kind of the history of feed safety. Um, it just happened to be that when um, I joined on faculty and Dr. Jason Woodworth joined shortly after that, um, our industry came to us with this problem of forcing epidemic diarrhea virus. And um, we continue to be confronted by evidence that looked like this was being transmitted through the feed supply chain. And that was around the 2013 time period, of course. And our initial reaction was no, and actually probably not even no, but hell no, um, that this isn't possible. We don't have viruses that can survive outside of, um, outside of a host. And certainly they can't be passed through the feed supply. Um, you know, the pet food side worries about salmonella, but on the swine side, we really don't have to worry about something like a biological hazard. Um, and then the evidence continued to ac accumulate. And I think it's because Jason and I were the low men on the totem pole and um, we're the newbies. And so we started working with Dr. Steve Dreitz on um, some of the feed safety initiatives. And as evidence continued to mount, we said, okay, I think that there, this really needs to be evaluated and demonstrated. And so we did a lot of our studies um, there in kind of the 2013 to 2016 time period with PEDV. And I'll be honest, we kind of thought that we were phasing out of feed safety. We thought maybe this was um, an initial reaction, an urgent industry need. We kind of worked to um, get past the urgency of it, understand a little bit, but certainly not anything that we were trained to do. And so we were kind of going back to our comfort zone and then lo and behold, African swine fever virus comes. And so since then, again, the industry has kind of ha has come to us again and continues to really reinforce to us that this is an area we need to work on. And so um, since our initial research, you know, right now we're working on ASF, of course, but we're still actively involved in research projects with PED and PERS and Seneca virus um, and transmission of things like Delta coronaviruses through, through different mills and trying to understand the likelihood, the probability, and more than anything, how can we prevent or stop transmission through the feed supply chain? From everything that you've seen, what um, when it comes to the different viruses or bacteria, for that matter, but also the some of these treatments or mitigation, right? So, what are the viruses or or bacteria again that that people should be more, more concerned about? And again, m mitigation on a okay, this kind of seemed to work very well. Yeah, I think people are always looking for the golden, for the silver bullet, mm -hmm. right? They're always looking for the answer, the one simple thing that they can do to fix all of these problems. And that doesn't exist in anything, including in feed safety. And so we continue to preach that prevention is key, right? So I was on the phone with Egan Brockoff this morning talking about ASF and some of the compartmentalization that they're doing. Um, and then I had a conference call with some of the Europeans um, as they're working on their risk assessment for feed with ASF transmission. Those two perspectives are so different because 
we're dealing with Europe where we have massive transmission through wild boar, right? And there's nothing more um, important in my mind from a pork industry than to continue to keep some of these really devastating viruses out. And so I think first case prevention and whatever we can do to continue to prevent it from entry altogether onto the continent. But after that, you know, we're really just looking at setting up hurdles. It's not going to be a single thing that destroys or, or prevents contamination or kills anything, any contamination that we'd be concerned about. It's really, okay, what can we put up in terms of supplier controls? What are things that we can put up with in terms of reducing our risk from thermal processing? What can we add to the feed that changes the pH, that changes the chemical or physical characteristics that it's less likely to harbor virus? We want all of those. And I know they're not always cost, cost effective, but as we're looking to protect the feed supply chain, implementing all of those in, in addition to biosecurity is each one gets us incrementally closer to kind of this silver bullet of keeping it out of the supply chain altogether. Very cool. And I mean, last several years, right, a lot of the suppliers changed that, you know, keeping the ingredients in a warehouse, right? What other major changes have you seen in the, in the industry on that aspect? Yeah, one of the things I'm probably most excited about, our, our friend Roger Cochran, I think has been doing a really nice job um, helping the industry understand the value of um, biosecurity and implementation of feed mill biosecurity. And I think that is still all over the board. I'll go into some mills and they do a phenomenal job on it. I'll go into other mills and they haven't really grasped the concept or its importance yet. And so certainly that would be one side of it. Um, and then also I think that there's there's a lot of potential with mitigants um, and some of the chemical mitigants that we see coming onto the market, I'm excited about them. But I also think there's a lot more work to do with them in terms of understanding their mode of action, the optimum efficacy, which situations are they most cost effective, to try to understand where should we use them and how should we use them to manage risk. That's awesome. Anything else on, on the whole uh, feed safety side of things? Uh, I mean, I know uh, Jordan is doing good work there with Vietnam, uh, more, more on the ASF. Is it, is it touching on feed safety there or not? Oh, absolutely. So one of our biggest concerns with um, with the Vietnam situation, and yeah, you alluded, alluded to Dr. Jordan Gebhardt, one of our colleagues who's really leading our efforts on the Vietnam side to help them understand some of the epidemiological transmission um, of new farms that might be breaking or control of existing farms. And we've seen a couple of instances now where, again, the feed supply chain can be implicated. And just the hardest thing in there is that we can control movement of just about anything into and off of farms, except feed. There's only so much downtime that we can have for a feed truck or for people who are moving feed and delivering feed from the farm or from the mill to the farm and then back to the mill. And so as we think about kind of the spider web that feed mills can make with what I call their epidemiological connections, they very quickly can go from contaminated farm back to mill to other contaminated farms and create kind of the spider web approach of contamination if, if we don't stop it and if we're not careful. And so yeah, Jordan's been leading up a lot of really interesting work there. Um, I think our big project for 2020 was that we built a feed mill inside our biosecurity research institute um, which is a BSL-3 facility and intentionally inoculated feed with ASF here in Manhattan, Kansas, wow. and went and saw, and we made feed and looked at where did that contamination go? How long did it persist in the environment? What are things we can do? And it wasn't very, um, it wasn't very encouraging. So a lot of the same concerns that we had with PED in terms of the transmissibility from batch to batch and the propensity that it has to be to go everywhere, we saw those same characteristics with ASF. That actually surprised us a little bit, but I think there's certainly risk. So it continues to support that we need to keep it out of mills instead of trying to clean up mills after they've been contaminated. If you look at uh, someone that is listening and, and, and um, what would be three things that a feed mill can be doing right now, just in general to, to improve that biosecurity? 
Yeah, good question. So first, know who your suppliers are. And when I say that, know not just who do you purchase the product from, but who did they purchase the product from. And so get to know who is your root supplier and the, the quality and safety considerations that they have in place or don't have in place as it relates to different ingredients. The second would be to implement some of those biosecurity procedures. And so um, think about what do you have for expectations for people on your farms um, in terms of are they allowed to have pigs? Are they expected to change shoes? Are they expected to stay in one area of the farm and not the other? We are at the point where we need to be implementing a lot of those very straightforward biosecurity measures into a mill. And then the third one is if you haven't priced mitigants um, and you haven't looked at the logistics of having to put something in, whether it's thermal or a chemical mitigant, go through the process because um, we continue to have flare ups with Delta coronavirus or with PED, where um, even with our own endemic pathogens, um, I think it's helpful for mills to know what does it cost and what's the practicality of flipping a switch on and putting a mitigant in for at least a short period of time. And if we have something catastrophic like ASF entering the country, you're going to want to know how much does it cost, how quickly can we get it put in, and having that front end information done will help you make those decisions more quickly. That's awesome. I appreciate the summary there. You know, as, as you transition to the undergrad and the teaching side of things, um, I'm very curious. I mean, I know you work a lot with undergrads and um, what, what, what have been a few of the, the insights there as you started to work on that arena? Something that I think a lot of people in our pork industry maybe don't know is that actually my my research appointment is actually very small. About 20% of my time is supposed to be spent on research. So I spend about 80% of my time in the classroom or working with students. And that's by design. I love teaching. And um, for me, there's nothing more exciting than being in a classroom of 18 to 22 year olds. Um, and so I teach our sophomore level nutrition class um, principles of nutrition, which any of our swine nutritionists and veterinarians and pork producers, most of them have all taken that class before. Um, and so I really enjoy that class. I also teach a graduate level monogastric nutrition class, and then I get to help teach undergraduate research. And so we have some course-based research projects that will run. And so even though I'm a swine nutritionist by training, every year I run a goat research project or, or a, uh, right now I'm in the middle of a suckling calf project and um, I've run some sheep projects and a feedlot heifer project. And so those types of things really have been very eye-opening to me. They've helped me appreciate different areas of research mm -hmm. um, as I've gotten to know more about them. And there's always things you can, nuggets you can steal from one industry to the other. And so it's been fun getting to work with students as we teach them kind of the concepts of how to do research and how to evaluate good from bad science. And you, in that interaction, um, you know, and, and, and the evolving generations, right? Uh, how, how do you see that, these new generations and in, in, in coming into agriculture, do you feel hopeful or not so much? Yeah, I am so excited about the future of agriculture. Um, I think maybe sometimes people can get a bit down on this next generation. And right. um, I hear that in the media sometimes. And even, even by once in a while, our, our pork industry folks, they think about you know the types and backgrounds of, of students that we have coming into the industry. Man, as someone who works with students every day, I am so excited about this next group of students coming through. I think uh, the Swine Nutrition guys upstairs and I sometimes remark about how we're not entirely sure if we could get Get into our grad our own graduate programs at this point <laughs> based on how how awesome some of the students are coming into graduate programs but even at the undergraduate level um, there's just some kids setting the world on fire and and showing really some leadership and some initiative I think one of the things I, I hear from time to time is, oh, it's this generation or here are the problems with them or they're on their phones all the time. You know, when I look back at um, kind of the, the turns of generations, I, I see, 
I think that we always have issues and concerns and questions about the next generation coming. And so, you know, whether it was the flower children or Generation X or the millennials, um, Marcio, you and I are millennials now, right? And I remember when everyone thought millennials were going to destroy everything. And so um, now, now as we're looking at this next generation, you know, they're very technologically capable. They're much further removed from the farm, but they have some unique skill sets and drives and initiatives that are different than what, what our generation or other generations before us had. And so um, they're very invested in, in the globe in, and they're very a very empathetic um, generation. But I also think that they're very driven um, and not just financially driven, but driven to do something important and do something big in the world. And so I'm confident that this generation of, of pork producers coming up is, is going to set the world on fire. That's super exciting. I love it. Now, as you know, as we went through the pandemic and as well as the, your experience with teaching, how do you see, and I know you, you, you and a group of folks published a recent uh, review on the topic, you know, online teaching and what did you find on that arena? Yeah, one of the things that I was surprised with from online teaching is that we still have issues with um, with connectivity in some of our more remote areas. And so that's real, that, especially when we first flipped the switch in March and went to completely online programming, that was a challenge for some of our students because they couldn't participate with their videos on, you know, even the ones that had, you know, most of most everybody has internet or cell phone service, but maybe not high speed internet access. And so that does change how we teach a little bit differently. Um, this semester I'm teaching, Face to face, but that means that I typically, for a class of about 100 students, I have 20 students in person. I have about 60 students who are participating on Zoom and participating online. And then I have 20 students who are catching the content sometime else. Um, so whether that means that they're watching the recorded lectures or um, at a different time. So it's a different semester for sure. Um, that has its own challenges because sometimes we feel like we're presenting into black boxes on Zoom. Um, but I also think that they've been uniquely engaged. I get way more questions in the chat function than what I normally would in class. Okay. Um, usually students that might skip on a Friday afternoon, I see them going in and participating in Zoom or catching the content before Monday's lecture. And so having, I think that we've really just seen a shift and we're going to continue to see this shift in, in teaching where our online programming and our virtual programming is going to have to get better. We're going to have to react to it. Wow, that's very interesting. Um, any learning on like you mentioned uh, videos and any tips on getting that engagement? Oh, uh, so one of the things I really enjoy is I have um, Pull Everywhere software. And so that's something that's been important for, for my classes, I know, um, to kind of just keeping them involved. I mean, we've all been part of enough webinars probably now that on Zoom, there are Zoom polls and each, each thing has their own unique feature. Um, but it's something just to keep them active because I know I've certainly done it on webinars before you zone out or your email pops up and you get distracted. And so something to keep them, like you said, engaged and connected to the content and information. And so whether that's stopping to tell a personal story about, you know, this toxicity or deficiency that I saw once in the field versus, um, you know, asking them some questions about um, their comprehension and application of the material, that bec that's become pretty important, I think. Cool. And then this paper mentioned uh, in the future, an estimated 90% of classes will have an online or virtual component. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. Yeah, I, so we're, we're planning right now for actually our fall 2021 semester um, already. And so as we sit here, it's, you know, the decisions for, for spring 2021 have already been planned. Um, we're planning our line schedule and what classes and when and the types of offering for fall next year already. And yeah, I mean, I certainly, there's a lot of things that I've changed about my class just to be able to make it so students can participate 100% virtually if they need to. I'm not going to keep all of them um, if we ever get to go back 100% to face-to-face, -to -face. 
but there are some things I'm going to keep. I like having the ability to record lectures and for students who are maybe gone for good reason to be able to participate. And I think that it's really helped us as educators get more comfortable with the types of technology that we have. Um, there's some things, some unique things on assessment um, and helping learn what the students are learning that um, we hadn't really been pushed before to measure that and use some of the technological tools at our at our fingers to measure it accurately. And so I think there are some of those things that will be silver linings to this whole crazy COVID experience. Yeah. Do you think uh, with all these changes, um, basically, you know, folks could watch this this session recorded and and the interaction with the teacher would be more on the discussion or problem solving type of uh, you know format. Is that where it's going? You think or or not? Yeah, it's hard to tell. And I mean, I, I, we've had some of these conversations because. For example, I went 13 hours away from where I grew up to go to college, right? And so in 10 years, will it be necessary to move 13 hours to go take classes from, you know, in this case, Kansas State University? Will it be necessary to physically go there in person? And in some level, I think that transition is important. Right. Where like I know certainly for me being able to, you know, going, being away from mom and dad, being responsible for myself for one of the first time, that process of going to college and living on your own and living in the land of purple of Manhattan, Kansas, that process was important. And so one of the things I worry that if we switch to 100 percent online and it's almost like commodity based education, who can do the best job with a fundamentals of nutrition class when everybody in the in the country teaches one. Um, I think that there might be some of those aspects we would lose if we go straight into that program. And so I think there's always going to be value of having a face to face in person educational component in college. But I think that a lot that that what that looks like will be different moving forward and so will there will we be able to have more classes we'll be able to have more engagement with smaller classes and so maybe some of the lectures and larger lectures are recordings or are kind of synchronously online and then we have smaller breakout groups i don't know what that looks like yet um but i'm excited to see it in the next 10 to 15 years and evolve that way if you could have something on a billboard Cassie, what would, would it say? A billboard that everyone could see it. Um, so my, my big, um, it's on my, it's on my watch right now. My, my big statement is I believe. That's all, just I believe. And I, I think that stems from a lot of different things. It stems from faith. It stems from my, um, I have a background in FFA. And so um, the FFA creed starts with, I believe in the future of agriculture. Um, but I think it also just speaks widely to just an outlook on life and um, a hope for something to improve and a belief in yourself and a belief in others to push forward and make things um, as good as we can. And so for me, I would have a billboard that says, I believe. I love it. Uh, on the teaching side, when you look at your, the best teachers that you have ever seen uh, in person or on, online or on the internet, um, what do they have in common? Oh, so my favorite teacher of all time, he'll be embarrassed because he'll listen to this probably, is Dr. Bob Goodband. <laughs> I love Dr. Goodband. Some of us have been fortunate to be yeah. taught by that man. Um, he doesn't get enough credit for as incredible of a teacher as he is. They have passion, right? So I remember Dr. Goodband walking in to my swine science class when I was a junior in, in college, and he said, I have the best job in the world. <laughs> and I totally agreed with him and um, kind of wanted to grow up and be just like Dr. Goodman, maybe without the mustache, though. And um, and I think that when I look at really engaging instructors, people that are really good at getting their message across, they're interesting, they're invested, but man, they're passionate. They want to be there. And it's clear that they want to be there and they want you to succeed in their classroom. And they're so passionate about the content that they want to try as hard as they can and in as many different ways to communicate that so that it gets from their brain into yours. 
And so I think that that passion is something that every good teacher I've ever had. Um, it's, it, it's hard to be, it's hard to be good at anything without that passion. I love it. Something that I, I noticed when I went to school in Brazil and then um, came, you know, went to K-State. And again, it's pro- I, I hard for me, it's hard to know, like, is it on a pro- I think the U.S. as a whole on average is that way. But then, of course, my sample size of one, it's tough to know. But <laughs> but the difference was um, a lot of the exams were way more assertive, meaning not asking that tricky question in page 174 second paragraph and back to Dr. Goodben's class, you know, very, it was fairly easy if you were paying attention because he was asking basically what you needed to know, you know, so I loved that. Yeah. One of my favorite questions of all time um, is from his class and it's, you know, a producer has 500 pounds of, or 500 tons of chocolate chips. Um, and they are cost this much, which of course their their cost they you can include them into the diet and, and um, they're cost effective to put into the diet. And the question is, should you buy them? And when you're trained as a nutritionist, the answer is always, well, yes, because when I run my least cost analysis based on the nutritional value of this and that, it's, it all makes perfect sense. And now I laugh at that because I work so much with feed mills that I'm like, oh my gosh, I cannot imagine if I brought them chocolate chips and how much they would hate me because mm-hmm. of the, like, they would have to mill them. They would have to, right? So that we'd have to grind chocolate chips. We'd have to have bin space for them. We would have all of these kind of things we would have to think through and what a great problem like you said from you know from a learning aspect of you know we we get we learn x plus y equals z but i think it's much more important for us to learn kind of the how to think things through and who all might be affected and that was one of my more important homework assignments that um i've never bought 500 tons of chocolate chips and thrown them on a mill before so thank you dr goodband that's awesome do, do you think on the teaching side, um, uh, what's your take on, on some of the teachers that do have practical experience versus zero? Yeah. So I'm one where I came straight from a PhD program into an academic role. That wasn't my ultimate plan. Um, I wanted to go into industry for five years, but um, the right job was available at the right time. And I just, right, so so as I was graduating, there was a job open and, and it, it just, the timing worked out for me. Um, but man, I wish that I had industry experience at times. Um, and I think that's why it's so important for me to continue to do research um, and to stay engaged in kind of industry committees and different things and, and be in the field, going to mills and doing different things because, it's really easy to get caught up in our theoretical world right. of academia. And that does not our, it doesn't do anybody justice. Um, so our students would get a disservice and um, certainly the industry. And so I think it's, it's important for us to maintain as close to that industry connection as we can. Um, there are some of the most phenomenal teachers who can tell you firsthand stories from their five or 10 or 15 or 30 years in the industry first before coming back into academia. There are others who gain that experience like I did through a consulting role or through working with with industry and research experiments and and, and projects. And so it's just different, Um, but I certainly think that we need to give value to all of those experiences and maintain as industry relevant as we can. Right. And that, that was kind of my point, right? You, you, I consider yourself, right? You are in the industry, right? I mean, that's what I mean too, is yeah. being as a, as a faculty, being involved in the industry. And that's always been uh, one of the key things, I think, at K-State um, on the Sign Nutrition Award, for example, you know, those folks, they're all day-to-day formulating diets for, for folks too. And you know what I mean? So, and as you are in these committees and things, so, and I, I remember having uh faculty or professors in in brazil in the vet school where many of them were like you know were not very engaged in the industry or that kind of stuff so 
that yeah, we're sense. fortunate to be at an institution that really encourages us to certainly from the research side, but even from the extension side. I mean, I don't have a formal extension appointment. Um, I only have a 20% research appointment. Certainly, I continue to get um, recognized for my efforts in both research and extension. And so um, I think that we really recognize the importance, but it's also kind of a credit to the pork producers, both in our state and our country, that continue to give that feedback to our administrators that say, hey, no, um, you know, it's it's great that we have the ability to go out and, and go to conferences, but also just to be able to go out and, and get in do some field work and and get into last week we were doing a or on Saturday we were doing a feed mill investigation and um, looking if there was some contamination in a feed supply chain with a, a few different pork producers and so um, having that ability to get in and get dirty is is important for all of us. I love it. Very good. Anything else either on feed safety or teaching before we go to the three questions that we ask every guest? No, I'm excited for them. All right. So the first one is uh, the your favorite swine related book. Yeah. So I could bring it. I could pull it out for you. I should hold on. All right. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. So this is the Fire of Life. So oh, um, do you not know this one? I don't think so. That's oh my cool. gosh. So this is it's by Kleber, Kleber and others, um, and I think it's like nineteen. 75 is this edition. Um, he was a professor at UC Davis and it's an introduction to animal energetics. And so it's probably because I teach a little, I mean, I teach the gross energy to digestible energy, to metabolizable energy, to net energy, right? Uh -huh. And so I think it's because I teach that concept for the first time to students. Um, but it's also, I teach a class where um, for the first time in their lives, they're using things like physics classes, which we make them take as prerequisites, right. and chemistry classes, and college algebra, and biology, and we make them take all these prerequisites to be animal science majors or to do something in our industry. And it's like one of the first times where all that comes together. And so the fire of life talks about energetics and glucose and ATP and, and energy partitioning within animals and K values. And it's just a very well-written book um, to talk through some of those theoretical concepts, but even to take them back into kind of the practical side. Wow. Very cool. That yeah. is super cool. I was not aware of that one. I love it. How about a book outside of agriculture? So um, I, I admire the people who are always giving you recommendations on business books. Um, it's probably because I'm a university professor, but I, business books are quite boring to me. Um, so um, I really like murder mysteries. Mm -hmm. um, but actually the book that I probably use the most is Clifton Strengths Finder. Um, and so I'm a big Strengths Finder fan. I know, um, when you were here at K-State, we did a lot of Myers-Briggs, mm -hmm. um, type assessment. And I know with our group, we do a lot of Strengths Finder and, and just kind of, again, the stage of students that I work with is they're trying to understand who they are and grow who they are, understanding how we can get them placed into a career that that best fits what their strengths are. Um, but I use StrengthsFinder all the time, even within our research teams, with our graduate students and with, with the kind of three other faculty that I work with most closely on the feed safety team to understand who should be taking lead of different projects, how do people enjoy being communicated with, um, and what types of projects are, are they best and most comfortable leading. That's super cool. Uh, I mentioned a, a few episodes ago that I, when I met my wife um, about six months in, uh, we both, well, I had taken already the strength finders and, and, um, and I asked her to do, and it was cool, right? Because it, yeah. you know, it kind of opened this box that sometimes it's not as easy to, um, to figure people out, you know? Yeah. So what are you, what are your top five, Marcia? So number one, and it's in order, right? As I understand. Yeah. So, so number one is yeah. the achiever. And then the, the, I think I have learner Focus, mm -hmm. analyt analytical, and competition. Yes. Oh, we're very fun. similar, what especially especially when I when I was younger. <laughs> Those were mine when I was just getting out of college. So my number one is relator, okay. um, and then achiever, activator, strategic, and significance. That's cool. And so, yeah, 
Yeah, I, I need to read. I, I, I haven't read all of them, right? It's how many? 30 plus, mm -hmm. right? I think 34. Yeah. 34. And it, it's incredible how, um, how accurate, I mean, they are, I think. Yeah, I really like it for, you know, I like Myers-Briggs at, um, I think Myers-Briggs is really helpful for kind of a, a relatively shallow level of interaction, you know, when you are first getting to know people and when you are um, working with them kind of broadly and beside them, but when you are leading teams or when you are intimate team members, like how we work at K-State with some of our feed safety research team, or when we're supervising students and grad students and trying to mentor them, understanding their strengths has become really helpful. So just, um, you know, I work a lot with like Chad Polk and Jordan Gebhardt and um, Jason Woodworth as a core of our feed safety team and understanding, you know, Chad's um, positivity and includer side and understanding Jordan's context and competition side and understanding Jason's harmony and responsibility side, like having that background really does help us kind of play appropriate roles for the students that we mentor and in how we communicate with with industry and in different teams and how we lead our students. Very good. Have you ever played a little bit with the disc? No. Oh, yes, yes. So Dr. Stark does that one. He has his students do that. So that's a whole other one that I haven't spent as much time on. Okay. We, we do that quite a bit too. And, and it's an interesting one. I think for me, that's one that with a few interactions, like you said, almost a shallow type, with a few interactions, you can almost probably tell they are strongest of the four profiles, you know? So yeah. It's, so it's interesting. So Yeah. Cool. And then the final question, I know you, you touched about the teachers, right? But how about in general, the swine professionals that you've interacted, um, what sets the, set the successful ones apart from those that are not? Yeah, this is the one question that I've been thinking ever since you first contacted me about, <laughs> about being on that, that I've been, I've been ruminating on. Um, and so for me, it, it comes back to really a passion and a drive to make things better. So I kind of go back to my billboard of, I believe, mm -hmm. right. And the people who are really committed and who I see as the movers and shakers of the current swine producers and, and swine industry leaders who I kind of can project out to see the next ones. There are people who just have this driven intensity to make things better in their sphere of the world, within their sphere of influence. Um, and that's different. I mean, there's a lot of people, I think, in today's day and age that are pretty comfortable where they're at and are comfortable with the world the way it is. But for me, I see the, the people who are really setting themselves apart are ones that have the ability to recognize and grow their influence and, and make the world better for others. Super cool. As we wrap up here, I have one more for you. Um, what is the one thing that not many, no one or not many people from the industry knows about you? Anything? Oh, no. <laughs> so um, a lot of people actually, so it's, it's funny because I have like two sides of the industry that know me. They know me as the student. And so if they know me as the student, they know me as Spencer's wife. So my husband used to, when we were, when I was working on my PhD, he um, was involved in the swine industry. And my husband is the most extroverted biggest kind of party animal that I have ever met. He is the life of the party all the time. Um, and then there's people who see me <laughs> and they haven't kind of interacted with Spencer and they see me as, as Cassie or they see me as Dr. Jones and like think that take me pretty seriously. I think to really fully understand me, you have to, you have to understand, like you said, with your wife, you have to understand the whole picture of our dynamic. And so, um, you know, I, I think something that continues to surprise my students is that I can enjoy tailgating at a football game and drinking a bush light mm -hmm. and cheering on the Wildcats as much as anybody else um, can. And um, I think that surprises some people. So. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I think sometimes we feel not only in our industry, but just in general, we we just feel that we have to be super extremely the most serious person that you're ever going to meet in life. Very professional, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, and I think, and again, maybe it's because I'm a teacher, but I think it's important for students to see, I think it's important for just humans to see other humans being human. 
Yeah. And I think it was always so impressive to me. John Patience would take us as, as grad students to interact with different industry professionals and introduce us to people. And it was always just amazing where these people who I would just consider to be these industry gods would just be normal people. And I remember meeting Charles Stark for the first time. He spoke at the very first feed efficiency conference. And I was in graduate school at the time. And I ended up working with Charles and now he's one of my closest collaborators and he's such a great friend, um, but he was Charles Stark, you mm -hmm. know, and I yeah. was just so um, kind of impressed with the name and uh, the notoriety based on his his world of knowledge and that reputation. And he's just a regular guy. He will, he'll laugh if he hears this, that I'm talking about, about him like this. And so I think it's important for us. And I think in, in general, the swine industry is pretty good about um, those of us that, that know each other pretty well. Um, we don't maintain a facade of uber professionalism. I think that there's a nice line between um, making sure that we get our work done, but also making sure that we're real. I love it. This is a great way to wrap up here today, Cassie. It's been a joy. Well, lots of great insights here for our audience. And uh, thanks so much. Thanks, Marcio. Take care. Imagine if with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven week long elite online training in applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.